city, and I'll give you a little bit of an update, which is uh, right after I finish speaking to you, I'm going to head off to a city council meeting. Our current declaration that's in place, where we believe the city is, uh, taking many things into consideration. Uh, from both sides of all the uh, advice we've been getting, from all the questions we've been getting. So we'll be having a robust discussion today among city council uh, to decide if there's things we need to add to our declaration, if there's things we need to shore up with our declaration, things we might need to change, uh, in addition possibly to what we're doing already, uh, although we are very pleased with what we've seen in the community, not as pleased as some people are. Uh, other people are more pleased. I think every city council member has been doing a great job of fielding the emails they've been getting on a fairly regular basis, day-to-day -day basis. I think right now the emails we're getting are somewhere between um, you want to kill people and then you want to put me out of business are pretty much uh, where we are seeing emails. So we're trying to find a place in the middle of that and uh, do what we can do for our community that's under, as we've talked about before, uh, sort of a one-two punch uh, economically and then as well. And I wouldn't even say more importantly, they're both uh, ravaging our community in many respects. Uh, COVID-19 as well. So we'll be having that meeting. There'll be something to report on uh, even in more detail after the council meeting. It's a one item agenda. That's all we're going to discuss. I uh, will go back to the weekend and what we have um, appreciated from our business community. The fact of the matter is the business community has been, been doing for the most part a tremendous job self-regulating. Uh, some of you are aware of what I did Saturday when I drove around and saw Home Depot and all the other big box stores and Best Buy uh, doing their best job of controlling their crowds and helping us with spatial, uh, with the separation and social distancing. Uh, I won't name out the, the re retailers that weren't doing such a good job, but I will tell you once we uh, made a couple of phone calls, they jumped into action, did the things they needed to do. And I wanna praise those local businesses that are part of national chains that did the right thing because they were doing what we asked them to do, contrary, quite frankly, they were and so very pleased with what they've done uh, the managers have been very proactive and and so I'm thankful for the things they have been doing I would anticipate that whatever we do as a city today uh, will extend at the very minimum what we're already doing we're waiting for what the governor is going to say considering his declaration actually expires I think uh, Friday at 11:59, and so after President Trump extending the national uh, guidelines to April 30th. I seriously doubt you'll see us do anything less at a state level, and you'll certainly not see us do anything less at a local level. So with that, I'll take your questions, and I apologize that I'm gonna have to leave right after this, but uh, I'm sure I'll talk to you again uh, in short order. And at this point, do y'all know what like, kind of businesses you're going to perhaps like, put some new restrictions on for this declaration? Not really. Um, We've been very pleased with what businesses are doing. We're struggling with the limits on small businesses and uh, the very precipice that we have uh, with some small businesses that are literally just gonna go out of business, uh, seeing where we are right now. So we're trying to be conscientious about that and uh, take all those things into consideration. Anybody else? Yes? Like at what point did y'all, like as a city, start to think that you guys needed a new order or a new declaration to start tightening things up more? Well, we haven't decided we need a new declaration. Um, what we're looking at right now is we realize our declaration will expire this Friday as well. So this today's city council meeting is, I would not call it an emergency meeting, it's just an extra meeting I called last week so we could continue to discuss it. We'll have another meeting next week. So uh, we're really just looking at where we are. I'm sure we'll take um, some issues up as far as are there things we need to tighten up? Are there things we need to uh, make perhaps more strict? Uh, but I'll also want our community to understand very well that regardless of what we do at a local level, if you're paying attention to what's happening in the state and nationally, uh, the buzzword of shelter in place is really a buzzword filled with exceptions after that. The most important thing that our citizens can do is to keep doing what they're being asked to do. Um, and if they see our retailers or other people not doing the things that need to be done, uh, make your voice heard. That's exactly what I did. And... Uh, just made my voice heard. Of course, people will say, well, it's your voice. That's great. We want to help out in any way that we can. And we're seeing people who at some times have been trying to test the limits or realizing that's not a wise thing to do. And one of the things, you know, Shane, in answer to your question, is making sure that people understand that even though we're limiting crowds at grocery stores, it's not a good idea to take your family of seven 
to the grocery store. Uh, maybe your family of one needs to go to the grocery store and the rest need to stay home. Yes? So if families want a barbecue, is there any restrictions to that of what they can and can't do? As far as a family having a backyard barbecue with their family, yeah. uh, I think the last thing we're going to do is start telling families you can't have a cookout in your backyard with your family, especially a family of, uh, you know, I grew up with families where they had eight children and two parents and now all of a sudden they're within the where they're outside the rules if they have grandma over well the fact of the matter is uh i don't think in our civil liberties we want to start restricting families that are sleeping together from barbecuing together or having their family over i don't think we're going to go down that road we're certainly not going to become san francisco and ticket you for smoking a cigar with your neighbor in the front yard so uh on friday you talked about how this city is a double whammy mm -hmm. with oil and gas and then also this virus so how are you going to be tackling that issue as you go into the rest of the week? Um, quite frankly, not being sarcastic at all, but very, very carefully. We're literally seeking a way for us to be the fulcrum on this teeter-totter, that one side is devastating and the other side is devastating, and how do, you, how do you do something about it? I know we're trying to ramp up our efforts at a national level uh, to see what we can do to encourage President Trump to be as about the oil and gas industry as he was about putting uh, tariffs on Chinese steel and other goods. Because um, the fact of the matter is this region supported him greatly and uh, we need him to wake up to what this region is going through as well. So on a national scene, that's what we're trying to do. And then on a local scene, also realizing that while at the same time someone's worried about their health and worried about if their cough is a symptom, there's a good chance that they're going to be among the several thousand that lost their job last week and lose their job this week. And realizing that support groups are having a difficult, difficult time meeting. Uh, we have AA groups who are having a difficult time meeting. We have people who need their support groups who are having difficult times meeting. And so our issue is not just happening, even though the most serious medical issue is happening at the hospital, uh, we have multiple medical issues that we're probably not paying attention to right now. And that was the truth. <laughs> no, I, we have multiple issues that we're, I don't even think we understand as a community the issues we're going to face if we get to whatever our curve is. And then we start coming down the other side of that curve is what we're going to see happen among the citizens of our community um, because there's nowhere else to go. The entire economy of this nation is headed into the tank. And so your welders don't just get to take off and go somewhere else. And your field workers don't just get to take off and go somewhere else. And um, when the nation is beginning to see news that says Midland's going to be the hardest hit city uh, possibly in the entire nation, uh, then that's something else we have to pay attention to as well. Is that part of the reason why you thought it was important to speak with the Washington votes to bring that into the conversation of the general public? Well, it's, uh, it's been interesting because, you know, we're out here and nobody cares about us. And then in a matter of three days, it's the Washington Post, it's CNN, it's NPR and everything else. And uh, so everybody acts like they're really concerned about this region. And then when everything gets back to whatever normal is, they'll start talking about how they hate oil and gas. So quite frankly, I'm not really concerned about what the nation thinks about us. Uh, I'm concerned about how we're taking care of each other and uh, how we're realizing we face different pressures than other places. Now, our pressures are different than New York's, and our pressures are different than San Francisco, New Orleans, and other places. But our pressures are our pressures, and uh, we have an economy that is probably more singularly focused on one industry than most places other than Detroit on a day past. So, yeah, it weighs on us very heavily. Drug and rehab centers, uh, alcohol and rehab centers, is there any outreach to see what they do to uh, with social distancing in their facilities? Most of them have reached out to me and have asked, can we do this or can we do that? Uh, and most of it has involved how they're spatial distancing among themselves in their meetings. And some of them are having them outside. Uh, I know I heard of one that was outside and somebody in the community didn't think that was right for them to have it outside in a particular place. There might have been 12 or 13 people there, and, and certainly can I make a case that that's against what we're trying to do? I can at the same time, but I've also worked with people in drug and alcohol rehab that I know that uh, the very day that they can't meet with somebody uh, might be the day they binge again. It might be their last day as well. So uh, they're working with us. They're doing the best they can do and trying to navigate a very difficult situation. Okay, thank you all. I'm sure I'll talk to you later. Good morning, everyone. I'm Russell Myers, CEO of Midland Health. Uh, this is our update for Tuesday, March 31st, 2020. 
I'd like to begin by thanking the mayor and the judge and the superintendent for working together with us to coordinate these, these uh, press events and, and live uh, updates. Uh, I think it will be uh, efficient and hopefully helpful to the community for us to be together each day at the same time. Uh, just to repeat the schedule that we've revised now, at the hospital we'll be a, doing a briefing every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Uh, just hospital folks at our uh, Abel Hangar Pavilion, and we'll be doing that on Facebook Live and other live platforms. And then on Tuesdays and Thursdays we'll be here at 9 uh, with the rest of the Unified Command Team. So thank you all for being here. Uh, <clears throat> quick update on the case numbers in Texas. There are now 2,800 plus confirmed cases. There have been 13, uh, I'm sorry, there have been 38 deaths uh, statewide, 13 total confirmed cases in Midland County, and one death. At the hospital, we have now uh, sampled over 300 patients. We're still waiting for over 100 results to come back, but so far only 10 of those 300 have been positive. We have 168 negative tests. Uh, Dr. Wilson will talk some more in, in just a moment about uh, the nature of the testing and, and what some of those uh, numbers might mean. At the hospital, our census is 108 today, which is only 40 percent of capacity. We continue to see uh, relatively low hospital volumes, significant uh, ability to ramp up capacity here in the near term if we need to. Emergency department visits continue to hold in the near 100 range, which is uh, on the order of about half of our typical ER visit volume. Uh, people are staying home, they're managing their own minor illnesses. Uh, we've seen lots of evidence of that. In our critical care unit, we have 11 patients. Uh, those patients we consider persons under investigation, a term we've begun to use regularly for people who are showing the signs and symptoms of a COVID infection but are not yet confirmed positive. Uh, there are five of those in critical care and five in a special medical surgical unit that's separately cohorting those patients. So a total of 10. None of those 10 have a confirmed positive test, but we're treating them as if they do. Uh, a few other updates. Visiting restrictions at the hospital remain in place. Uh, we're trying to uh, severely limit the number of people who are not hospital workers who are coming in and out of our facility. Uh, when you come to the emergency department now as a patient, you're going to be given a mask when you enter uh, out of an abundance of caution. That's the policy as of a couple of days ago. We made a minor change to visiting restrictions yesterday. Uh, the, uh, since the beginning, we have allowed a few exceptions, a pediatric patient with a parent, uh, a patient who is incapacitated and unable to speak for themselves, who needs a caregiver with them, uh, and a partner for a laboring mother. Uh, in most cases, that's the father, and we had uh, put a restriction in place that didn't allow fathers to go into a cesarean section into the operating room environment. Uh, we've changed that as of yesterday and we've loosened those restrictions so the fathers can go now into a planned C-section. Uh, of course, if the patient has to be intubated and there are, are more invasive procedures happening, then we'll ask the father to leave. But that, uh, that loosening of restrictions happened yesterday. Uh, we are still accepting uh, personal protective equipment uh, donations. That's an important part of our, of our effort to assure there's enough of that uh, kind of equipment to protect all of our employees who need it. Uh, that's gone very well. The community has been incredibly generous. We moved the location for that collection as of today. So at 10 o'clock this morning, we will be relocated to the Abel Hangar Pavilion. That's directly across the street from the main hospital facing Andrews Highway and the Walgreens store. Uh, right out front, we'll be doing uh, collections from 10 to 12 today. If you have personal protective equipment or hand, sanitize, hand sanitizer or anything else that you would like to donate. Um, on that note also, uh, you may have seen a feature in the paper today about a, one of the folks who is sewing masks. Uh, we have a, a large army of people who have sewn for us and for others in the community in the past who have repurposed their, their efforts to sew handmade masks for us. Uh, those masks are very useful to a lot of different people. They're not in 95 respirators by any stretch, but they can be very valuable and have been. We've handed out hundreds of them. We need all of them that we can get because they're, they're very popular. We're putting them on every ER patient. Many of our employees uh, feel safer wearing a mask throughout their day. Um, so anyone who uh, wants to sew and uh, has a desire to help us, uh, you're welcome to do that, and we would appreciate that effort. 
Um, finally, the uh, last thing I want to do, we, we have uh, <clears throat> uh, been thinking about how we can tell the community about some of the special work done by uh, perhaps some unsung heroes in the hospital today. I'd like to talk about respiratory therapists. Uh, that's one of the probably the least understood of the health professions, but our respiratory therapists perform all sorts of uh, tests and therapies that relate to our ability to breathe and to do so successfully. Uh, most importantly, they manage our ventilators. Uh, and so the fact that they're doing that, they're involved in the patient's breathing uh, and the ventilation uh, means they're absolutely on the front line. They're the person who is most at risk because they're right in the patient's face uh, dealing with their, their exhalation uh, and uh, often with uh, intubated patients on ventilators. So uh, our, our respiratory therapists are among our most versatile employees. Uh, over the years we've taught them, uh, our critical care physicians have taught them to start arterial lines and to, to do things to make it easier for our physicians to do their work. So uh, a shout out uh, in, in praise and thanks to our respiratory therapists today. Uh, thanks to all of them. If you're around the hospital, one day you'll be able to be in the hospital again. <laughs> uh, they're the folks in the wine-colored scrubs, a uh, great part of our team. So I'll, I'll take questions uh, from the hospital's perspective. Dr. Wilson is going to follow me, so if you'll, you'll save your medical management questions for him, I'd appreciate that. But anybody have a question for me? Um, why the change in allowing callers to come uh, and see a C-section? So why the change in allowing fathers to come and, and uh, accompany their wives or, or significant others in a C-section. Uh, you know, everything we're doing is evolving. Uh, we, we first, the, the restrictions first allowed fathers to be in the labor and delivery suites. Uh, and so for, you know, about 15, 12 to 15 percent of our patients, uh, a normal delivery turns into a cesarean section. Uh, and traditionally, we have allowed fathers to be in the room with them. Um, and as we thought about it, we had at least one father who spoke up. I think we had a question a couple of days ago from someone who was facing a, a mother who was about to deliver by section and was facing the prospect of doing that without her husband in the room. You know, as we get feedback, we can rethink, we can reprocess. I think our main purpose for not allowing them in the first place was to preserve personal protective equipment. But we found, um, as we talked about it, that we have special packs just for fathers to go into C-section rooms. We weren't really using those for anyone else, so it was a pretty easy decision to make at that point. Um, you talk about respiratory therapists being truly on the front lines. Is there any therapist that could speak to the press about this, your FaceTime, something like that, so you can really get that firsthand perspective? Uh, questions about uh, allowing one of our respiratory therapists to be available to the press. I, I'm sure we can work that out. We'll, if you'll work with TASA, we'll find somebody who can, can speak to you directly. Thank you. Yes, sir. How many people on staff are able to work with eventually? How many people on staff are able to work with ventilators? Mm -hmm. uh, well, there's lots of different categories of people who work with ventilators. Of course, we have our, our critical care physicians and our pulmonologists. Uh, we have a total of two pulmonologists and one full-time critical care physician. They're the ones who direct the usage of the ventilator, who determine what patient goes on it, what settings it has uh, to provide the therapy they need. Uh, we have a small army of respiratory therapists. I couldn't tell you how many of those we have, but all of them are are trained and actively manage ventilators as they're in use. Um, gosh, I'd have, to, I'd have to find a number up. It's 25 to 50 respiratory therapists, I think, in that ballpark. Okay. Um, that's, that's most of the answer. So yesterday you touched on how we haven't seen a spike. It's been pretty consistent. Correct. Um, but I was reading articles about states surrounding us, how their doctors are anticipating that they have example, Oklahoma, they're anticipating the peak being 17 days. Is the state of Texas anticipating a similar trend that we haven't quite reached that peak? We're getting there. The question is about when does the, the virus peak, and I, I think that's the answer to that is yes. We are anticipating that we are not at the peak. Uh, there is some very good work being done using various epidemiological models. Uh, we got some information yesterday from the UT system where they are attempting to model most of the major cities in the state. They had done a model for Austin already, and their peak was actually several months into the future. Uh, and the, the predictions depend very, very heavily on the extent to which we take seriously the shelter in place, social distancing, uh, hand hygiene, uh, 
admonitions that we're getting from from our public health folks. Um, the more we distance, the more we stay at home, uh, the farther out that peak happens and the, the shallower uh, the peak becomes. That's really important because the worst case models show far more need for hospital beds and critical care beds, as you've seen in New York, uh, than any of us can put together. So uh, if we do the mitigation strategies that we're talking about, we have a chance to manage this within the resources we have. Uh, that modeling we expect uh, to be provided specific to our region, Midland and Odessa, uh, sometime in the next few days. We know that the UT uh, scientists are working on that now, uh, and that will be very helpful to us as we plan for what the worst case looks like, uh, how many resources we will need to add uh, to our community's complement of beds and, and critical care capacity uh, as we unfold. Yes, sir. Test, you say we're up around 300 so far, and with the peak not here yet, we're probably going to climb a little bit. Are your sources for testing uh, getting better, coming back faster? The, the question is about our, our testing labs uh, and whether they're getting better. Yes. Uh, the majority of test results that have not been received are at least a week old. Uh, there was a period with one of our lab partners where they had a really difficult time getting results out to us timely. Uh, they are still struggling to finish up those those older tests. The tests we've taken in the most recent days, really about the last week, have come back for the most part in the 24 to 48 hour time frame. So the most current work we're doing is coming back quickly. Uh, the older tests we've taken, uh, we're still waiting on. Okay. I'm going to ask Dr. Wilson to come uh, and follow me. Dr. Wilson. Good morning. Um, Russell, and several of the questions have been related to the testing. I want to just kind of talk a little bit about what we're learning more about this virus and what I'm hearing from colleagues around the country and in studies uh, to give a little framework around that. Uh, th this virus is wily. Um, it is a very virus for doing the job that it wants to do, and that creates the problem that we've been seeing all over the world. It seems to be apparent that the virus can be spread before a person is symptomatic. It seems that even when somebody is symptomatic and they have the virus in their system and we've diagnosed the virus with a test, that if you test again um, in successive days, they may be negative and may be positive on different days. So it behaves um, in a very good way to protect itself from being discovered and to spread itself quickly before people recognize that it's even there. Uh, we've seen patients coming into our hospital that we're pretty confident have the virus that are presented with headache or neurological symptoms. We had a patient that proved to have a positive test that had shown up in another uh, facility a day beforehand with a blackout spell in a young person that would normally be worked up as a syncope episode and not be treated as though it's this virus. The following day with respiratory tract symptoms and fever, the patient was tested and proved to have COVID. So this, this is a... Uh, a very efficient virus, as I mentioned, and it, it hides itself well. And I think that's part of the reason that many of our tests so far on patients that we believe are, are infected, Russell mentioned, and that we, you've heard me speaking about previously, have proven to be negative. We're going to have a meeting. Uh, we have a meeting every day on, on the COVID clinical operations process, and we're making adjustments, um, as you've heard over and over again. This is a fluid um, issue, and we're managing it as we go. Um, and we're going to probably start, based on the, the meeting today, with our multidisciplinary group, including our infectious disease doctor and lab, to start testing patients that are hospitalized that we believe have it on a daily basis to see if we find the COVID infection on day two or three, as opposed to you know just going with the negative that we had on day one. That's, that has been our policy. We're going to move away from doing that. So you have heard some things about just tests and I'm beginning to believe that there's some validity to doing more testing, not so much that we find um, what we know is true, that the virus is in our community, that we define it a little bit better and we confirm that more readily in patients that we're hospitalizing already. I think the take-home message from the points that I just made, I think it's very, very important that we behave in a reasoned, paranoid fashion that everyone you know might have this virus. They may not be acting symptomatic, but they may be spreading it. They may be having different kinds of symptoms, but they may actually have COVID. 
So we have to continue the social distancing. We have to continue to be practicing good hand hygiene and all the practices that you've heard us ad nauseum speaking about. Because this is fundamentally true, that it's in our community and we may not be able to test for it and get it on the first testing and it's out there. And if we're not careful about this, this spike that you've heard Russell mention that you've heard us talk about before could come and we could be in a situation like you're seeing in Dallas or you're seeing in New York or you're seeing in other parts of, around the country. That This is a serious issue and if we don't take it seriously, it could create bigger problems down the line. I appreciate Russell's shout out to our respiratory therapists, their frontline um, individuals that are in the face of this on a day-to-day -day basis. I had a phone call last night from one of our anesthesiologists, Dr. Brad Brock, um, concerned about that as well. And his, his point was that those on the front line are dealing with it every day. We have patients in the hospital now. We have our first responders here that are going out and responding to people every day that may have this virus. And if we don't do our part as citizens to protect them, then they're at risk and they can end up in the hospital themselves. And we're seeing that all over the country. I'm reading reports of guys in my specialty, emergency medicine, that are on ventilators. I don't want to end up on a ventilator. <laughs> I know these guys don't want to end up on a ventilator. So if we all do the right thing, it's not just about protecting ourselves from one another, but it's protecting our health care providers so they're there to protect us as this disease progresses. Because no matter how you shade this, we're, we're talking about bending the curve down we're not talk, talking about eliminating it. This disease is in our community. We're going to be seeing some of it. The key is to see less of it and to do the best job we can in managing that. Um, one last point I want to make, because this is something you've heard me speak about a little bit before. The social distancing piece is the most important part of what we do because the spread of the droplets is how the disease is spread. You heard Russell mention that we are masking people as they come in the hospital or providing masks to them. There's increasing information out there suggesting that what common sense would dictate to mitigate the spread of our breath and the water droplets can help. So even though the masks, the CDC and others say, don't really prevent you from getting exposed, it can decrease the spread of our breath in the air and, and our coughing and our sneezing in the air. So wearing a mask, if you have a mask, is not a bad thing to do. And I'm, I'm, I've kind of switched on that. You've heard me say before that the social distancing is the key, but just that mechanical bridge can be protective. And I think that anything we do to try to mitigate that. So you heard the mayor saying, let's be cautious when we're going to stores, work with retailers. If you walk, if you go to a store and there's a congregation of people out in front all closely knit, go to a different store. You know, you know, let's be wise about what we're doing. Don't allow yourself to be in close proximity to others. Everything we can do to mitigate the spread is going to dampen that curve and, and help prevent this disease from spreading and, and having a spike like we're all worried about seeing in other parts of the country. So, thank you. I'll, I'll entertain any questions. Um, one about the, call it a very, very efficient virus. So, so kind of an answer to those that talk about the flu numbers being greater and trying to battle that argument. What would you, how would you compare the efficiency of this to the flu? I mean, flu is pretty transmissible also, but I mean, we're, we're learning as we go with this, as you know, but there's, there's reports that, um, that what I described is occurring all over the country that people are, are finding that people are testing positive when they're asymptomatic. Uh, we're having people that are testing positive on one day and negative on another day. The uh, atypical presentation on the front side is, is true. Uh, so those are behaviors that are a little bit different than influenza. Influenza typically comes on like a you know, ton of bricks and you know you got it and, and that's what it is. And so this uh, behaves uh, differently than that. Yeah, especially the point about the, uh, you can transfer it without even showing signs yourself. Yeah. Yes, sir. And you had a comment the other week that you worried that some of the negative tests that we've gotten back may actually be positive, that the tests weren't sensitive enough to catch all of like the correct um, cases that are. Uh, is that still a concern of yours? Is there anything else you guys are trying to do to get a hold of those things that may have slipped through the cracks? Yeah, I, th I think that it goes back to what I was just describing. You know, as, as more we learn, the, the better we are at kind of describing that. So I think the test itself is probably plenty sensitive. My pathology guys got mad at me for for making that comment because if, if there's DNA on the swab, it'll be positive. Uh, but the problem is we don't always get the DNA on the swab. We don't get the virus. 
And so when, when somebody's shedding, we don't know really clearly. If, you know, as I just mentioned, you can be positive on day one and two days later into your disease, you're still very sick, you're still in the hospital, and you're negative. Why is that? You know, so I, it's, uh, you know, that's a study out of, uh, that was in JAM out of Singapore. Where they, their hospitalized population, they tested them every day while they were in the hospital, and they were intermittently positive and negative. And it's, so there, there's, the more you test, the more likely you're going to find the disease, and, and I think we should be a little bit more liberal in our own institution about those that we think have it, the PUIs that we have in the hospital, testing them serially rather than just one time. And so does that go for some of the other patients too, more PUIs, but the larger group of tests to do it multiple times, or is that something you all have the resources to do? I'm, so completely asymptomatic people that we think don't have it, but just test them just as a surveillance? Well, I mean, as like just the total number of people that you guys have been testing, do you think those people should have been tested multiple times, or? Well, I mean, if, if a patient isn't hospitalized, the ultimate message that I think is really, really important is to be, you believe you got COVID, so self-quarantine until you are asymptomatic, until you've had the, you know, your symptom onset was at least seven days previous, You've been asymptomatic, meaning no fever, without any antipyretics or you know Tylenol or aspirin or anything on board, for at least three days, and your symptoms are resolving. That's the CDC's recommendations. I think that's a good recommendation. There's no reason to just serially test somebody because that's bringing them back out in the community and to them. Just self quarantine if you have symptoms and follow those instructions. And they're available on CDC.gov to walk you through how to both go on to quarantine, what to do while you're on quarantine, and how to get off of quarantine. So you touched on how this virus is wily. It is smart. It knows how to adapt and how to camouflage itself within the human body. And so you're talking about keeping this curve low or um, so that we don't overwhelm the hospital system. So why do you think it's important that we continue to strive keeping that curve low because you're seeing this virus and more data come in where numbers may not mean anything? but you still need to keep that curve low. Why is that important? Um, I don't understand the part Sorry. about numbers not meaning anything, but I, I, think, I think the point is that if, if we allow the virus to just propagate in, in the population to say, let's get back to normal, let's just you know, behave like it's not here, once that virus starts spreading as transmissible as it is, we're going to have a significant number of vulnerable people and aged people get the virus, and they're going to get very, very sick, and they're going to end up in the hospital on ventilators. And we have limited resources to manage them. You heard Russell mentioning we have three pulmonary specialists in our community, you know, one critical care specialist and two pulmonary doctors that manage critical care patients. We have a handful of anesthesiologists that can manage vents. We have a couple of ER docs that are recently out of training that still do some critical care kind of stuff. We've got a handful of other surgeons and neurosurgeons that have fellowship training or some experience with critical care management and can help us step up there. But that's very limited when you start talking about getting potentially hundreds of patients that might need to be on ventilators in a relatively short period of time. It's not like New York City, but it's, you know, for Midland County and for this environment, that's a lot of patients and there's not enough beds, there's not enough ventilators to manage that. So if we don't dampen that curve, we are going to have really difficult decisions about who gets a vent, who doesn't get a vent, how do you manage those vents. I mean, it's just a scary proposition. And if we, if we bend that curve down and we're able to manage that in, a, in an appropriate fashion, we all do well. Will this uh, virus change into something deadlier if it would mutate into something stronger? I, I mean, that's a you know that's an unknown. That's that's a coronavirus question. You know the, about how it behaves. But so far, the information seems to suggest it's not migrating very rapidly. There's been some literature that's talked about looking at the DNA structure of the virus, and uh, so you know some viruses seem to mutate really quickly, and and are and this one doesn't seem to be behaving that way. Uh, but that's a that's a complete unknown. I feel like we're starting to see more and more trends with this affecting not just an older population, but also kids. We recently had an infant who came back positive. Um, how would you explain this to parents to make sure that their kids aren't as vulnerable to the virus as maybe they initially thought? Um, yeah. So, so the um, I mean, I think we've known all along that this is not uniquely infecting older people. It just tends to be more severe in older people and in those people that are more vulnerable to the disease. If you have underlying health issues, it tends to be worse. So although we have some children in the community and we've had some adults in the community that have come down, but we've had some adults in the community that have come down with it in their 20s and 30s, 
that have ended up on ventilators, we believe, their PUIs, they weren't confirmed, but, uh, but they got off the ventilator and they went home. Uh, and that's the difference between the, the aged and the vulnerable versus the uh, others. You know, you might get really, really sick and go into respiratory failure and need some pretty critical care treatment for a while, but you'll ten, tend to, you know, uh, be plastic enough to bounce back from it and, and move on. All right. Thanks very much for your time. I think Whitney, are you, yeah. So health department. Good morning. I want to start by giving an update. Um, as you know, when we uh, reported on Friday, we had eight cases. Now we're up to 13. Uh, we got those five over the weekend. Um, male in his 50s that had contact to a known case. A male in his 20s that was that is travel related. Um, a female in her 20s that also had contact with a known case, a male in his 20s that had contact with a known case, and a male in his 20s that um, is travel related. The updates that we have are that uh, several that we reported from last week and of even the ones from over the weekend are recovering at home and some are uh, almost completely recovered and um, have gotten past their point where they uh, the 72 hours symptom, uh, the symptoms um, easing up, so they're ready to go back to work even. Um, all contacts have been made um, for several of the, the cases that we have. And um, the investigation is still ongoing, of course, with several of the cases. Uh, the ones over the weekend we still are uh, calling that they're keeping in contact with the health department and several of them that were mentioned last week. Um, going forward, considering we are now in the double digits with our cases, uh, I will present these to you in regards to age brackets, gender, uh, if they're at, in hospitalized at home and kind of break it down just so it's a little bit health department to keep track of, but also you um, at home and in the media to understand the, the the demographics of our caseload that we actually have here in Midland. Do you guys have any questions? I saw on your <coughs> mini program says uh, figure out where some of these patients have been in Midland. You were not here on Friday. Yep. Yes, I, <laughs> I touched on that on Friday. Uh, the, but I, I do appreciate you asking that again because I will hit on it because I think it's a good point to, to emphasize through our investigations, we're finding out that a lot of these people, uh, if it's travel related, once they've made it back to Midland, and if they're symptomatic, they're staying put, they're staying at home. So we're, we don't have any places to report of concern in Midland because people are recognizing this for what it is, how contagious it is, how dangerous it is, and they're going home and they are staying, um, self, they're self-isolating and only leaving to either get their, get their swab and then returning home. Yes. Is there what are you what are y'all doing to bring information out to the Hispanic community? What are we doing at the health department? Yeah. Doing? Um, well, we have literature that is in English and in Spanish. Uh, we have, as I said before, staff manning the health department four three two six eight one seven six one three. And we have English and Spanish people that are answering, or employees that are answering the phone, and they ha they are there to COVID nineteen related questions. So we are a source for for that community as, as well. How is the patient who was diagnosed with COVID doing? Doing well. They are recovering at home. As I said, they are actually ready to get back to work. Some of them, of course, um, are are um, probably not going to get, be able to go back to work. But the ones that still um, are their employees are still uh, allowing that and they're ready to go. I think you had a question, didn't you? No? Mm -hmm. Okay. How is that infant patient doing? Doing well, yes. Yes, the ones that we have aren't, aren't sick enough to be in the hospital, so they're, they're recovering well. They had mild cases. They were lucky enough to have mild cases. Has it picked up at the health department when it comes to testing or has it stayed pretty consistent since all of this started? 
testing in regards to COVID. we at the health department do not provide testing so um, when you're saying has it picked up we are doing the well, we're investigations we're yeah. yes we're doing the investigation so yes we're still all hands on deck um, everybody is still working seven days a week so yes it's it's definitely picked up so health departments around the nation, do y'all get like, like on conference calls and discuss this? Or I have a text thread from everybody in Texas and it goes off around the clock. Yes, we stay, yes, we stay in communication 24 seven it seems. <laughs> Any interesting highlights that like kind of came out of those text messages from people in other counties that y'all learned? Um, that people are dealing with the same issues. Um, I believe either Russell or Dr. Wilson had hit on of how the earlier testing is coming, taking so long to come back, and our more recent tests, we're getting those results back sooner. Um, a lot of them are having issues with um, the compliance and the and the social distancing, and uh, kind of what what can we do as as public health professionals to enforce the importance of that. We they've talked about the shelter and and home and. The different counties that are doing that and kind of uh, what uh, Mayor uh, Peyton had mentioned is making sure they them them so they can do what they need to do so it it definitely ranges from that to what services some of the health departments are still providing um, in regards to focusing most if not all of our resources towards COVID-19 Good morning, um, Arlanda Reddick, Superintendent for Midland ISD. I want to thank everybody for being here and allowing us the opportunity to come together and unify in a way that uh, brings much needed information into our community. I want to begin by thanking uh, many people that you've seen and have heard from as well, which is uh, Mayor Payton and his leadership for our community, uh, the hospital CEO, Russell Meyer and Dr. Wilson, uh, County Judge uh, Terry Johnson, and our Midland Health uh, Department, County Health Department. Uh, what an amazing team assembled for a time like this um, and a needed time uh, to have that leadership in our community. A phenomenal job that they've done. Not only get information out to our community, but to help lead us in this way as well. Also, I'd like to thank many of the unsung people who don't come up before you many times, but that you see them in our community um, day in and day out. Those individuals who are in our grocery stores, those first responders who are out in front, um, uh, dealing with this day to day and many of those new teachers that we have um, uh, parents in the home who are leading in a remarkable way and doing an incredible job. I want to bring out an announcement. Uh, we've been working through this from day one when we let out of spring break going into the weekend uh, leading into um, what eventually became the governor's announcement led to what closure could look like around our, uh, our state of Texas. Uh, we will be continuing our closure. That closure will go through May 1st uh, with the probability of returning back to school May 4th. It's putting us in a uh, time frame that allows us to start to understand uh, what we need to do in our phasing model. We've worked our phasing through food and we refine that as we've gone further and further and more and more in depth uh, around what that could look like for our community and I believe we're doing it at a, at a high level uh, from pushing buses into community areas as well as opening up sites as they come, as well as developing our Meals on Wheels program in order for our community members to get to food as opposed to having to come to one of the 27 and six bus sites that we have. We're now into our phasing around academics. Uh, we're in phase two, what I call our academic um, uh, platform. Uh, that was, uh, phase one was assessing the landscape. Phase two is determining what needs could come out of the, the assessment of the landscape around technology, whether it be high tech, low tech, and then now into the delivery of what phase two could look like currently right now. Uh, that began yesterday at lunchtime with the opportunity to have um, what would be packets in a low tech model, as well as refining what the high tech end could look like. Uh, the phase three of the plan is to deliver your teacher to you through a platform. 
uh, an online platform. So there's survey information that's going to be coming, coming out to our parents, if not already, that is asking what are the tools that you have within the home? How many of those tools and resources do you have in the home? What are the number of students you have in the home that can access these tools so that we can get a, a good idea of what um, hardware is needed around a device, whether it be do you have access to a smartphone, do you have a tablet, a laptop, a desktop, a smart TV, what are the things that you have to obtain those resources, and do you have the uh, modem uh, through Wi-Fi to, once you have those tools, to access that. So that's a very important uh, piece for us. And so right now we're equipping buses with Wi-Fi uh, so we can have an idea of where do we need to push buses as an opportunity to get into our community so that uh, we know that those resources are readily available. I appreciate the mayor as well in the regard, uh, around expanding what Wi-Fi could look like in our community. So we're working with the IT team from the, uh, from the city as well as our team within the district to assess what those resources are that we can go out to our community. Uh, we're working on MiFi devices. You may have heard uh, uh, locally or regionally around the, the, the nation in regards to what that could look like. There's a huge back order on what a MiFi device, which is a hotspot that you could give a student what that looks like. Uh, we have that order in uh, that um, we have a back order of what that could look like uh, in regards to what that need um, is. And you can see, you know, right now that's what a uh, number of individuals, uh, districts, and uh, parents as well are looking for in regards to that need. So we'll be assessing what that looks like, but just uh, first and foremost, the bigger news is that we will be closing through May 1st, and we'll get more information as that um, as it develops, so that we can determine what those needs look like. We're assessing. Um, on a top-down, in essence, on our student body for what it could look like for seniors, taking care of our senior group, so we could know what ranking could look like, right? So what does our top 10 um, and beyond uh, top 12 could look like for ranking within our high schools? What does ranking look like for the entire senior class? What does GPA look like for the entire senior class? Who are those that still had remaining um, deficits within courses that have to be covered and, and closed? And then how do we then progress to the other levels of grades as we uh, move all the way down to our pre-K kids who are now ready to become kinder? Uh, there's a lot of moving parts within this. Uh, they're still very active in the work that we're doing. Proud of the work that the team has done uh, to deliver something to our community in a different platform that we've experienced over the last century to say that we want to now educate 27,000 students in a home environment and how can that be a deliverable and meet that challenge within the week's time uh, to push something out into our community. Nothing is perfect, nothing is optimal, I will share with you. Uh, we're working through a lot of factors that, that are challenging our team as well as I'm challenging them, the board is challenging them, they're challenging themselves around delivering something that is um, as relevant as what you could get in a classroom that we could provide at home. Still challenges to go through with uh, individuals at home. You'll be hearing from us on Tuesdays and Thursday mornings here, as well Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. We're doing our live Facebook so that you can get updates through that platform. Uh, we're doing Wednesdays um, Facebook Live will be in Spanish so we can reach our other part of our community as well. So we'll have our Spanish speakers on our Wednesday Facebook Live at 4.30 so we can um, bring that to our community so everybody is getting as relevant the information as possible and in the language as possible. Questions? Yes, sir. Yesterday in your Facebook Live, your chief of staff said that when asked about coming back on Monday, that the school district was uh, keeping open all possibilities. What happened between now and uh, then that led you to believe that closing till May 1st was the right idea? Right. I will share with you uh, the question is, you know, what happened between uh, conversation on Facebook Live to today's this morning's conversation and say that uh, May 1st is that day that time frame that we have in front of us now so been in a number of conversations I think from the very beginning in regards to what could it look like uh, to set a time frame around our community knowing when the possibility could be that we return back as well as what could closure look like so those are been two very relevant conversations ongoing from the day one the time frame from Yesterday to today uh, led into 
Uh, we want to make sure that we're, we have all of our um, information ready for our community to go out. It was not ready to be delivered yesterday afternoon, so that was going to be a this, uh, morning piece once we knew that we had all the moving parts. I want to be sure that I'm talking with, um, with uh, our emergency management operations lead, uh, Justin, so that he can ensure that their team is ready. I want to be sure that I'm talking with the hospital. I want to be sure that I'm talking with the county uh, and the city to make sure that they understand where we're moving next and want to be sure that all those conversations are had as well as internally that we're ready to um, have that conversation internally and the expectations for the team on what that deliverable should look like um, has been met. Uh, this is a, a, a Permian Basin conversation, so Ector County ISD's superintendent and I in conversation as well to see could we um, make this happen in this time frame so that both staff members are ready to move forward with that. And that's part of the challenge of getting this information um, out um, uh, slow to go fast so that we can be sure that we've hit all those moving parts um, around that. Um, I think President uh, Trump's announcement as well helped uh, formulate what it could look like for us, uh, knowing that we were going to extend what closure could look like, what was the time frame around what closure could look like. I believe that was a, uh, that's a factor that came into play as well. Yes, sir. You previously said that uh, school count, uh, school length when the school calendar. Correct. Will there be any um, talk, discussion of bringing kids back sometime during the summer to make up for the, what will be two months out of the classroom mm -hmm. and not only, and then two also. And then two from summer. For next year. Right. So the question is, what does it look like when we've shared, I've shared that the 22nd would be the last day of school. What does summer learning look like from that point on? And I've coined it summer learning. We've got to think through when uh, kids have been in um, a classroom, a home of a class, what that could look like. And there's going to be some type of learning environment that we're going to have to set up over the summer. I'm not saying it's a formal class that kids are walking into, but we need to think through what could um, either starting the year with an opportunity to come in a week from 8 to 12. These are just ideas I'm putting out uh, that could uh, into something. Uh, for learners who are, uh, that need to uh, maintain the course, who are behind or who have gaps, what does that look like? We've done this every year. We call it summer school in some form or fashion. And we need to think through what does some summer learning look like for students who need to um, come back into the environment and, and dive forward. Can't tell you what that is today, but I could tell you that we're going to have some form of a summer learning opportunity for families to dive into so that their kids can get the best as they walk into the 2021 school year. Yes, ma'am. Uh, you know, at the hospitals, we've talked about how there's a need for masks. There's right. a need for more equipment. But uh, I think it's an interesting conversation. There's a need for a lot of equipment within the schools. We've talked with Midland College. There's a backlog for those uh, computer projections that they use, mm -hmm. um, Wi-Fi hotspots, right. what other equipment does the school need that they're just waiting for orders to be placed? That's probably the bigger one, the hotspots. Uh, we looked at what Chromebooks, that's our device of choice for students. Uh, we're doing another incredible job with the county and the city and upgrading what Wi-Fi could look like for our community uh, to put us on what is uh, Wi-Fi 6 platform. Uh, those uh, devices that need and require that Wi-Fi 6 have not been built yet and they're coming out uh, this summer. So I, I believe we'll be good in that standpoint on what Chromebook and going to a one-to-one -one, um, opportunity for our community could, uh, could provide. So that, that's on the forefront. I believe on the hardware side, on other devices that we have that don't meet that Wi-Fi 6 that will be coming in the mid-July timeframe, I believe we might be able to meet our need uh, currently in our community. We have others who have begun donating and appreciate what that could look like. But I will tell you the challenge uh, will come from students who don't have scissors in their home, right? Students who don't have crayons, students who don't have notebook paper, things that we collect and get to start the school year that kids come with their backpacks all loaded and their supply bags on meet the teacher night and they bring those in. Uh, they're bringing everything in and everything was left, right? So we just kind of um, brought everything in, it's been left and kids have now gone back home. So meeting what those needs are, so we're trying to be very uh, cognizant around the design of lessons that require the supplies needed in order to build it out. So that's uh, something that we're working through also. Here's want to think through 
uh, and how they can support what help could look like. And talking with your neighbor, you know, as you're as you're navigating, do you have scissors in the home? And I'm not talking big giant scissors. I'm talking scissors that a kindergarten needs to use, right? A little rounded and uh, that provide for a smaller hand. But those are some of the smaller things that we need. But the larger things, uh, we're going to find that you know everyone around the country is looking for the more technological device. But the the most basic are some of the things that um, I would challenge that uh, we need to get out in front of our students. Well, we have a very philanthropic community. Absolutely. Here. Have you guys discussed setting up a donation site where people can maybe drop off supplies like that? I will tell you that um, our our volunteers who step forward in our philanthropic community, which is need looks like and I would tell you if people want to meet that challenge on top of that they're more than welcome to buy and bring um, what could be for their home or others uh, to our school locations but I will share with you uh, that I, I find it very important um, as we're reaching out and some people could call this wrong and, and it doesn't bother me in any shape or form but um, I want to be sure that our kids have the best right uh, I think that there are times when people think well it's not good enough for me, but it's going to be good enough for somebody else in regards to maybe it's a crown that's been uh, driven down to just the nub. I want to make sure that our kids have what are the best out in front of them, much like I would want to provide in a classroom and in my school setting. And I want to make sure that that's the intent. Uh, the intent is if you have quality, bring what that quality looks like and bring it forward. Um, but if it's not, you know, it's, just save it. Yes, sir. I will tell you that um, we're serving almost 12,000 meals a day. Uh, just multiply that out times five. It's been an incredible lift for us. There's going to be some things at the end that I believe that as a, as a school system we'll have to tackle and take on in regards to some cost around that uh, because we've made an effort that we want to reach out and feed our community uh, who needs that feeding currently right now. Uh, so I'm proud of what our, our uh, Child Nutrition Services team has done to embark on building what that platform is. I'm proud of those individuals who are unsung, who are on the front line, who are making that come to a delivery every morning at 7.30. We're gonna keep what this uh, cycle looks like. It works and it's working well, which is the 7.30 to 8.30 breakfast delivery and the 11.30 to 12.30 lunch delivery. Um, we have our volunteers and we had over 400 plus who come forward to say if they wanna support what this help could look like. Those volunteers were, were there early breakfast morning at 7.30 in our central office picking up box loads of paper uh, that had the packets in it to take to campuses for that delivery. So appreciate what that could look like. But I would tell you our food program has been one that's been uh, fluid, uh, it's been adaptive, and it's been delivering. And so from pushing out to over 40 homes uh, for food uh, that people are dri driving by and, and leaving on the front porch and ringing the doorbell and letting them know the food has come forward into their home because little ones or elderly who may be taking care of little ones couldn't come out to the campuses uh, to pushing our bus sites uh, into our community. It is so dynamic what we've done around food just in that one little sense. Um, and I've shared before that there are communities around our state that have not moved uh, as progressively as what we've done to push food into our community. So proud of that team for what they've done and the leadership to be out there uh, to support that work. So thank you for that question. Anything else? All right, thank you. Uh, I want to start out by getting a lot of folks asking us what we plan to do in the future with our deadline of our uh, declaration coming up. The president has said what he's going to do. I would assume that goes down to the governor. I won't speak for the governor, but I can assure you we will do what the state is doing. Um, fully intend to see a 30th deadline extension on our declaration. Um, I want to, the folks here that are sharing information, I want to praise all of them, uh, from the mayor to the hospital to the school to everybody, the health department. Um, the information you're getting is what we know. Nobody is uh, holding anything back and they're telling you everything there is to tell you and you guys are going out and reporting it to the citizens of Midland and I appreciate you for doing that. I've noticed 
since I've been in on these that your questions are getting less and less and I like that in that I think you're getting all the information there is to get um, and so I think it's uh, it well for everybody in here that's sharing that information um, one of the thing one of the questions I hear when somebody is identified a new number or a bigger number or a new case is who what when and where have they been um, and I think mainly what we should be thinking about is instead of that person, we should be thinking about us. Um, um, instead of thinking of where they've been, we should take for granted we've probably stood in line with somebody that's been exposed. We should just start thinking that way. If we'll start thinking that way, instead of I might catch this disease, I've started thinking another way. I hope I don't spread this disease. It has caused me to stay away from folks hands cleaner. It has caused me not to touch surfaces as much. It's caused me to keep my hands away from my face. My understanding, and uh, Dr. Wilson may say different, my understanding is this comes through your eyes, your nose, and your mouth. So if I keep my hands away from my face, that's about as important as, as washing my hands and keeping my hands clean. Uh, so it's incumbent on us to take care of ourselves. Um, this weekend I noticed I went, I stopped at a gas pump and uh, was getting gas and it was a convenience store and I noticed uh, a vehicle pull up to the front of the convenience store and a mom and a dad and three kids bailed out and, and hooked it into the convenience store. That's not using your head. It's been mentioned before, one person. Uh, at the courthouse, uh, we're mandated by the state. I can't close the courthouse. I've had many emails telling me I need to close the courthouse. Uh, until the governor tells me to close it, the courthouse will remain open. I, I can't close it. But we can curb how we're doing things, what we're doing, and what fashion we do it so that we protect the employees we have as well as the public that comes in. But I was going to uh, one of the offices to take some legal paperwork yesterday, and in walks a mom with five kids, uh, and I'm sorry, is a mom with two older kids who the two kids with them were these older kids' kids um, to get one copy of a piece of paper when only one person should have been up there. We've got to start using our brains. Um, I'm getting a lot of pressure from folks to do a shelter-in-place mandate. Um, to folks that I've just described, that shelter-in-place isn't going to help. We're going to have to use our brains. We're going to have to use peer pressure. Um, I'm real proud of the mayor saw some stores that weren't doing what we would like for them to do. I'd like to do a shout out to Bobby Burns with the Chamber of Commerce. I had seen a situation and called him an verification uh, and he took it a step further by calling the store and before long the situation was corrected. So um, we, we can ask our fellow citizens to do the right thing on our behalf. Uh, one of the things is essential services. Uh, if your business is essential, that's up to you to decide right now. Don't make us make that call. Uh, you know if your business is essential. If you're a hands-on type of business, and I'm not picking on a hairdresser, but a hairdresser is going to be messing with your head and all around you and bumping. Imagine you've got a little dust and a flower on you, and that hairdresser is working on you. Little of that dusting is going to get off on you. So do you want to put yourself in that position to have that happen? Now, if my tooth is hurting or if I've got a piece of metal in my eye, I don't mind that dust getting off of me because I need to get that metal out of my eye. So you're going to have to decide for yourself what's important um, and what's essential. Um, but other than that, I, I do praise everybody. I'm seeing a lot of uh, compliance from the public, uh, a whole lot of compliance from private industry. I'm so proud to see what everybody's doing to uh, come on board and make this as, oh, it's not a pleasant, make it as manageable as an experience as, as folks have done. So, Other than that, that pretty well wraps up today. You, okay, all right, thank you all.